I want to welcome Vit Tang Nguyen tonight. Uh, he is the third writer in our uh, Fiction and Forms uh, reading series. He was born in Vietnam uh, and at the age of four fled the country with his family when Saigon fell to the communists in 1975, right? Yeah. His family first resettled in Pennsylvania but then moved to San uh, Jose, California where Nguyen was raised. He is now an associate professor of English and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He's the author of Race and Resistance, Literature and Politics in Asian America, and published this month, uh, Nothing Ever Dies, uh, Vietnam and the Memory of War. Uh, both uh, critical bookends, Vit has said, to a creative project whose fictional bookend is the novel The Sympathizer, one of the most um, uh, critically acclaimed novels this past year. I want to tell you a little bit about how it's been acclaimed, because it's, the list is quite long. Uh, the Sympathizer won the first novel prize from the Center for Fiction, uh, the Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction from the American Library Association, the Asian Pacific American Award for Literature and Fiction. It was also a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award, an Edgar Award for Best First Novel, the Penn Robert Bingham Prize for Debut Fiction, and the LA Times Book Prize for Best Mystery uh, and Thriller. It also made it to over 30 end-of-the-year uh, best book lists, including uh, lists from The Guardian, The New York Times, and The Wall Street Journal. It's really an honor uh, for me to have Vit here, uh, not only because I like him and because of all the success he's had this year and, and because of the deep talent and intelligence he displays in his writing, uh, but also for all the work he's done to support the art of Asian Americans and specifically Vietnamese Americans for many years now. And beyond that support, he has, more importantly, with his creative project, given force and depth to a voice that was always there, but just not readily heard. The Sympathizer is many things. It is a spy thriller. It is an immigrant novel. It is a novel about war and its endless aftermath, its perpetual evolution in our cultural imagination. It is also overtly and unabashedly a political novel that presents itself as, a, as an angry corrective to the many accounts of the Vietnam War in American popular culture. As Vitt has written, all wars are fought twice, the first time on the battlefield and the second time in memory. And even though the U.S. lost the war in Vietnam, it has, in a sense, fashioned itself a victory in the decades since by putting itself at the center of its literary, cinematic, historical recounting of the conflict, even when it is severely critiquing itself. Into this tradition, Vitt asserts the narrator of The Sympathizer, a perspective that privileges for once the Vietnamese political and philosophical voice. He is half white, half Vietnamese, a spy who works for both the communists and the South Vietnamese, whose sentiments, behavior, and struggle in the novel embodies both the humanity and inhumanity of all the sides in this conflict. The novel, I think, is an act of empathy, even when it denounces and critiques. It's a novel of uncommon ambition and artistry, and a deeply important one because of that. Please help me welcome Vit Tang Nguyen. Thanks, Vu. Um, I think that's also particularly meaningful for me because, as some of you have already heard, you know, uh, Vu and I, we didn't go way back, but I knew of Vu many, many years ago when uh, we tried to get him to come to USC in, in, our, uh, in our creative writing PhD program, and of course he didn't come, and did something much better in Las Vegas. But eventually, you know, we saw the fruits of that project in Dragonfish, which is a great novel. I really loved reading that book, and so it's very meaningful for me to be invited by someone who, uh, you know, is as accomplished as Vote 2. Basically, the, these two books come out of a lifelong uh, project of mine inarticulate at first and increasingly articulate as I got older about grappling with what the Vietnam War means both for Vietnamese and Americans and then increasingly for other populations as well and also a lifelong project that became a lifelong that became a, a, a an important project about just thinking about war memory and power like how do we deal with, with these things first for me as a novelist but then also for me as a scholar how do I think about these things um, in a more explicit way outside of what I can do in fiction so um, I'll focus mostly on the sympathizer, like I said, but I'll give you a bit at the end about Nothing Ever Dies, which will explain a little bit about um, where the sympathizer is coming from. So the sympathizer, you know, is a, about a communist spy in the South Vietnamese Army, and um, it, it, the novel begins in April of 1975 as Saigon is about to fall or be liberated depending on your point of view. And of course, he as a spy who is of two sides of, uh, is, sees this historical event 
from both perspectives. And his job is to flee with the remnants of the South Vietnamese army to the United States, where his, where his mission is to spy on their efforts to take their country back. And this really did happen. You know, I grew up in, and, I, and I saw some of these accounts of South Vietnamese veterans who had not yet given up the war. So part of the novel deals with that, but when he gets to California, to Los Angeles, he also, like the other refugee, refugees, has to make a living. So one of the ways that he does that is to become the authenticity consultant on a movie, an epic war film about the Vietnam War, soon to be shot in the Philippines. And in this scene that I'm going to read, he has just met the director of this film for the first time, known only as the auteur. And uh, you're gonna encounter a couple of other characters, his boss, uh, known only as the general, and the boss's wife, madam. After I descended from the auteur's home to the general's, I reported my first experience with the motion picture industry to the general and madam, both of whom were infuriated on my behalf. My meeting with the auteur had gone on for a while longer, mostly in a more subdued fashion, with me pointing out that the lack of speaking parts for Vietnamese people in a movie set in Vietnam might be interpreted as cultural insensitivity. Do you not think it would be a little more believable, I said, a little more realistic, a little more authentic, for a movie set in a certain country for the people in that country to have something to say instead of having your screenplay direct as it does now, cut to villagers speaking in their own language? Do you think it might not be decent to let them actually say something instead of simply acknowledging that there's some kind of sound coming from their mouths? Could you not even just have them speak a heavily accented English? You know what I mean, Ching Chong English? just to pretend they're speaking in an Asian language that somehow American audiences can strangely understand? The auteur grimaced and said, very interesting, great stuff, loved it, but I had a question, what was it? Oh yes, how many movies have you made? None, isn't that right? None, zero, zilch, nada, nothing? and however you say it in your language. So thank you for telling me how to do my job. Now get the hell out of my house and come back after you've made a movie or two. Maybe then I'll listen to one or two of your cheap ideas. Why was he so rude, Madam said. Didn't he ask you to give him some comments? He was looking for a yes man. He thought I'd give him a rubber stamp of approval. He thought you were going to fawn over him. When I didn't do it, he was hurt. He's an artist. He's got thin skin. So much for your career in Hollywood, the general said. I don't want a career in Hollywood, I said, which was true only to the extent that Hollywood did not want me. I confess to being angry with the auteur, but was I wrong in being angry? This was especially the case when he acknowledged he did not even know that Montagnard was simply a French catch-all term for the dozens of Highland minorities. What if, I said to him, I wrote a screenplay about the American West and simply called all the natives Indians? You'd want to know whether the cavalry was fighting the Navajo or Apache or Comanche, right? Likewise, I would want to know when you say these people are Montagnards, whether we speak of the Bru or the Nung or the Tai. Let me tell you a secret, the auteur said. You ready? Here it is. No one gives a shit. He was amused by my wordlessness. To see me without words is like seeing one of those Egyptian felines without hair, a rare and not necessarily desirable occasion. How could I be so dense? How could I be so deluded? I naively believed that I could divert the Hollywood organism from its goal the simultaneous lobotomization and pickpocketing of the world's audiences. Hollywood did not just make horror movie monsters, it was its own horror movie monster smashing me under its foot. I had failed, and the auteur would make the Hamlet as he intended, with my countrymen serving merely as raw material 
for an epic about white men saving good yellow people from bad yellow people. I pitied the French for their naivete in believing they had to visit a country in order to exploit it. Hollywood was much more efficient, imagining the countries it wanted to exploit. I was maddened by my helplessness before the auteur's imagination and machinations. His arrogance marked something new in the world, for this was the first war where the losers would write history instead of the victors, courtesy of the most efficient propaganda machine ever created, with all due respect to Joseph Goebbels and the Nazis who never achieved global domination. Hollywood's high priests understood innately the observation of Milton Satan, that it was better to rule in hell than serve in heaven, better to be villain, loser, or anti-hero than virtuous extra, so long as one commanded the bright lights of center stage. In this forthcoming Hollywood trompe all the Vietnamese of any side would come out poorly, herded into the roles of the poor, the innocent, the evil, or the corrupt. Our fate was not to be merely mute. We were to be struck dumb. So part of the novel uh, also deals with memory. Like, what does it mean to lose your country? Um, what does it mean to long for it? And certainly growing up in the Vietnamese American refugee community in the United States, I was constantly surrounded by the sense that uh, people had, people were suffering. They had lost everything, not just their country, but oftentimes many of their relatives too, and identities. And so, you know, this this sense of longing for the past and of missing the, the home country was very powerful. And I wanted to address that in the book, but I also, you know, wanted to acknowledge that for all that the Vietnamese people here in the States were suffering, they were also they also knew how to have a good time. So if you know anything about Vietnamese people, they love to sing, dance, drink, and hang out in nightclubs. And so this next scene takes place in a nightclub in Los Angeles and also based on a true story that soon after the Vietnamese refugees arrived, one of the first things that they did was open this nightclub in Los Angeles. And this became the eventual basis for something called Paris by Night. How many people have heard of Paris by Night? A few. Well, if you know anything about Vietnamese people, Paris by Night is a very famous song and dance extravaganza that is now in about 120 episodes. And it's a huge production. And now it's filmed in places like Las Vegas and Paris. And in the 1980s and 1990s, these things were being sent back to Vietnam on videotape. And it was the major form of entertainment because the Vietnamese and people in Vietnam could not produce anything like this, right? But this is the modest origins of something like Paris by Night. Our narrator goes to this nightclub and he encounters a woman who is the forbidden fruit, Lana, who is the daughter of his boss, the general. Now known by just one name, like John, Paul, George, Ringo, and Mary, Lana stepped on stage, clad in a red velvet bustier, a leopard print miniskirt, black lace gloves, and thigh-high leather boots with stiletto heels. My heart would have paused at the boots, the heels, or the flat, smooth slice of her belly, naked in between miniskirt and bustier. But the combination of all three arrested my heart altogether and beat it with the vigor of a Los Angeles police squad. Pouring cognac over my heart freed it, but thus drenched it was easily flambéed by her torch song. She turned on the heat with her first number, the unexpected I'd love you to want me, which I'd heard before sung only by men. I'd love you to want me was the theme song of the bachelors and unhappily married males of my generation, whether in the English original or the equally superb French and Vietnamese renditions. What the song expressed so perfectly from lyric to melody was unrequited love, and we men of the South love nothing more than unrequited love. <laughs> Cracked hearts are primary weakness after cigarettes, coffee, and cognac. Listening to Lana sing, all I wanted was to immolate myself in a night with her to remember forever and ever. Every man in the room shared my emotion as we watched her do no more than sway at the microphone, her voice enough to move the audience, or rather, to still us. Nobody, stopped, nobody talked, and nobody stirred, except to raise a cigarette or a glass. An utter concentration not broken for her next, 
slightly more upbeat number, Bang Bang, My Baby Shot Me Down. Lana's version of Bang Bang layered English with French and Vietnamese. The last line of the French version echoed Pham Zui's Vietnamese version, We Will Never Forget. In the pantheon of classic pop songs from Saigon, this tricolor rendition was one of the most memorable, masterfully weaving together love and violence in the enigmatic story of two lovers who, regardless of having known each other since childhood, or because of knowing each other since sh childhood, shoot each other down. Bang Bang was the sound of memory's pistol firing into our heads, for we could not forget love we could not forget war. We could not forget lovers. We could not forget enemies. We could not forget home. We could not forget Saigon. We could not forget the caramel flavor of iced coffee with coarse sugar, the bowls of noodle soup eaten while squatting on the sidewalk, the strumming of a friend's guitar while we swayed on hammocks under coconut trees, the whisper of a dewy lover saying the most seductive words in our language. An oi. The working men who slept in their seclos on the streets kept warm only by the memories of their families. The refugees who slept on every sidewalk of every city. The sweetness and firmness of a mango plucked fresh from its tree. The girls who refused to talk to us and who we only pined for more. The men who had died or disappeared. The streets and homes blown away by bombshells. The streams where we swam naked and laughing. The secret grove where we spied on the nymphs who bathed and splashed with the innocence of the birds. The shadows cast by candlelight on the walls of wattled huts. The barking of a hungry dog in an abandoned village. The appetizing reek of the fresh durian one wept to eat. The sight and sound of orphans howling by the dead bodies of their mothers and fathers. The stickiness of one's shirt by the afternoon. The stickiness of one's lover by the end of lovemaking. The stickiness of our situations. And while the list could go on and on and on, the point was simply this. The most important thing we could never forget was that we could never forget. So um, I have a lot to say in the novel and we can talk about that, but I, I evidently didn't have enough room, so I had to go on and write another book called Nothing Ever Dies. And I just want to read the um, a p paragraph from the prologue of this book. and. It, it, as Vu said, I think of these two books as the bookends of a, of a larger project of war and memory. One is the novel, do, deals with it in fiction, and one is nonfiction, a cultural history that takes up how many different countries have remembered the Vietnam War, from Vietnam to the United States to Laos, Cambodia, South Korea. And the point of doing that was because, you know, my thinking was both the ways that Vietnam and America have remembered this war have been reductive and have served to, to affirm certain kinds of worldviews in both Vietnam and the United States. So it was really important to get out of these two countries and look at this war in, in, uh, in a comparative and global way. But uh, it was also my intention to write this book, taking everything that I knew from writing fiction and, and using emotion and narrative and rhythm and, and uh, themes to try to bring this cultural history alive for readers and to in interject a little bit of myself into this book. And, and this, this opening, this paragraph in the prologue will probably give you some sense that the sympathizer in my novel and myself are not that far distant from each other in some ways. I was born in Vietnam, but made in America. I count myself among those Vietnamese dismayed by America's deeds, but tempted to believe in its words. I also count myself among those Americans who often do not know what to make of Vietnam and want to know what to make of it. Americans, as well as many people the world over, tend to mistake Vietnam with the war named in its honor, or dishonor, as the case may be. This confusion has no doubt led to some of my own uncertainty about what it means to be a man with two countries, as well as the inheritor of two revolutions. Today, the Vietnamese and American revolutions manufacture memories only to absolve the hardening of their arteries. For those of us who consider ourselves to be inheritors of one or both of these revolutions, or who have been influenced by them in some way, we have to know how we make memories and how we forget them so that we can beat their hearts back to life. That is the project, or at least the hope, of this book. Thank you.